Oh, no, I didn't order it. Thirty seconds. Everyone, Anna is here. A big round of applause for Anna. Yay! <laughs> Go. Go. All right. Thank you for coming out, everyone. I'm David Allman, chair of the Wake County Libertarian Party. If you have not been here before, um, again, thank you for coming. I have a few uh, basically public service announcements about things we have going on, and then we're going to get into our event. Uh, the format for our event is going to be a little different than what we've tried before. You're actually going to have three different people speaking. might be slightly longer than the normal 35, 40 minutes that we do, um, but I think we're going to have some great guests speakers and we're going to have a great conversation about something very important, our Raleigh City Council elections and the issues around that. Um, so as far as public service announcements, thank you everyone that came out for the food bank event we had last Saturday with Joe Warren. Um, we have a few tickets left. We're going to the Bunch of Jerks uh, baseball game in Durham Bowls. That's Friday night at 7 p.m. So we have a few tickets left. If you're interested, please see Brad Bessel. Um, as far as other events, our next speaker event will be September 11th, and that's uh, North Carolina Treasurer Dale Falwell. Um, we've heard him speak not here, but at a couple other events. Fantastic guy, uh, one of the few people who seem truly motivated to protect taxpayer dollars. And tomorrow night, if you are interested in Certificate of Need Laws, AFF has an event. and I can tell you all about it if you have questions, and that's at the uh, Headquarters Capital Club. Uh, but there is a lawsuit going on around certificate of need laws, and uh, another topic libertarians care about a lot because we love freedom. Anyway, with that in mind, uh, this event, why we're having this event, is traditionally turnout in local elections, municipal elections, has not been what it should. And a lot of those issues actually do directly affect us, the decisions they make about growth and development. As even scooters. A couple of you used to come to this meeting on a scooter and currently cannot find a scooter. Um, some of you may have been renting out a room using Airbnb and now, uh, or perhaps a condo if we're home. And those rules have changed a little bit. But the two major things that face Raleigh are two things that always come up are growth and then who decides how to manage that growth. This is this larger metropolitan area. It's one depending on the ranking and who you're using of the source. Um, it's like the third fastest growing area in the country. That kind of growth presents real challenges, and that's what Raleigh City Council, Wake County Board of Commissioners, a lot of the decisions that are made are basically made on how to deal with that growth. So with that in mind, I'm supposed to be using this, my bad. Just covered a little bit of the why. Our guest speakers are Robbie Riker, Time and Jacob Rogers from the Triangle Community College. All right, a couple of uh, I want to lay out real quick before we get Robbie up here. Oops. Go back. North Carolina, without going into a long conversation about the Illinois state versus the Illinois state, most of the powers that the Raleigh City Council has have to be granted through the North Carolina General Assembly. An example was recently in Raleigh, they lowered the age or the time in which you could purchase a beer on Sunday to 10 a.m. It used to be new. That that was something the state has to give the city the option or power to make that change. So what's important to remember is you'll often hear people on Raleigh City Council currently or former members will say, we would have done X but the North Carolina General Assembly wouldn't let them. Sometimes that's a bit of a cop-out, and sometimes it points to a, a true issue. 
All right, Raleigh City Council has eight members, a mayor, two at large, and five districts. Our current mayor, Nancy McFarland, will not be running again. Our two at large members currently are Russ Stevenson and Nicole Stewart. Uh, Russ has been there for seven terms, Nicole in her first. And those are our five district council members Vicki Thompson, David Cox, Corey Branch, Kate Crowder, Steph Mandel. Vicki uh, Thompson will also be stepping down. So already we have 25% turnover on uh, city council. City council is a challenge in this regard. Only the mayor makes the money. The mayor makes over 90 grand a year. The others, I think, a little bit over $1,500 a month. What? Really? And then the resume is even less. It's like 14, 16, 17. Okay. So that that is one of the challenges. I know, for example, Corey works for a Fortune 50 company and is allowed to basically take time off to do the job. The job is very demanding, much like North Carolina General Assembly members don't make much money. Uh, it requires either a very immediate employer with some flexibility there, or uh, basically have to be retired, which several members are. I'm going to let Robbie get into the candidates. They're also on the sheet. I don't want to just sit here and read names, but there are quite a few people running. And that sheet of paper flew away. And we have a couple of uh, candidates here. James Bledsoe and Brian Fitzsimmons. By the other candidates. And that's our slate of candidates for the different districts. Um, some of those are very competitive races, and uh, we haven't had that in a while in some of those districts. Again, I, I point out that Raleigh is the third fastest growing metropolitan area. I mean, when I say Raleigh, it includes Wake and Durham, the Triangle area. Um, but the growth in this area is phenomenal. It puts a tremendous strain on transportation, our roads, and roads and housing are in most polling data the two main issues i mean that's what people care about and how we manage that growth to deal with the traffic to deal with the cost of housing and how much housing we can build and where that's really what most candidates are talking to in one way or the other so with that in mind i would like to bring up robbie Riker, and he's going to talk a little bit about the demographics and, uh, For those of you who don't know, I was an at-large candidate in this race, along with Colin Watson, who was one of your libertarian members here. Uh, both of us dropped out of the race for similar reasons, mostly because we wanted to get Russ Stevens out of office, and uh, we didn't think that he'd done us. I closer to well. um, So I spent a lot of time over the past six months analyzing the statistics of Raleigh as well as the candidates. Now that I'm not an active candidate, I've been working a lot with the current candidates. So I want to get elected, so I'm just going to have to um, I'm going to talk, start off with a little bit about the votes and the Raleigh. Um, yes. Okay. So this is a graph of who's voted, how many people voted in the last several elections. You'll notice that uh, there are about 303,000 registered voters in Raleigh. Uh, by far the biggest turnout in years is the presidential election, so you can look at 2016 for that, where about two thirds of registered voters turned out for that election. 2018, we had a midterm election, a little less, but still pretty good turnout for the midterm actually, which had 178,000. But if you look at the off year elections, when municipal races happen, turnout is much, much lower, right? Um, so in 2017, we had the highest turnout for the municipal election in Raleigh of 50,000 people for the main election. They actually had slightly more people for the runoff election. The runoff election happened when a runoff was called between uh, Mayor McFarland and Charles Francis. And I got a lot of publicity, so like at least a couple more people out. But still, the turnout is really low. And that's something to keep in mind. I'm going to spend a couple slides digging into who are those people that do vote, uh, demographic wise. Uh, start off with the age of those voters. <laughs> So the average age of a registered voter is about 45 years old. Um, and in the presidential and midterm elections, you stick kind of close to that, see 48, 49 years old. But in municipal elections, much lower turnout, the age is much higher. And around 60 years old is the average age of someone that votes in city council elections. 
we run through this, the bias sort of also reflects who is currently on city council, who is elected city council, mostly older people, and not just older people, but older white people. Okay? Um, so this breaks out the race of uh, who uh, percentages. So we're looking at percent of registered voters. So uh, the green is uh, registered voters, the yellow is 2016, uh, red is 2017. So what you can see is voter turnout goes down. The percentage of those voters that are white goes up, and the percentage of that are other races goes down. This is an interesting statistic there. So we look at that, and this whole voters are really white. Why is that? We don't really know that for sure, but one thing you could guess there is that traditionally, uh, the people that are most engaged in local politics or city politics are homeowners, and most homeowners in Raleigh are older and whiter. Uh, so just something to keep in mind there. And as you've seen in uh, in uh, city council discussions recently, trying to get renters brought into the poll as well is something that changes, changes quite a bit. Uh, party affiliation, I just had to throw this in here since this was a libertarian meeting here. Uh, but what percentage of the registered voters in Raleigh are part of the different parties? Uh, so, Democrat, of course, Alabama is the biggest uh, here in Raleigh. Followed by unaffiliated, and then Republicans, much smaller. Uh, we'll see in our municipal elections a higher percentage of Democrats vote. Uh, while our city elections are uh, not partisan, uh, party does tend to matter when it comes to who gets elected. Most people, when they're trying to decide who to vote, if they're doing some research, not all voters research the, the candidates, they're going to look out the party that way. And also, party does play a role when it comes to financing too. Typically, if you can help, um, your party can help with financing. Oh, if you're curious of those numbers, by the way, for Libertarian, uh, I think it was 2,200 registered Libertarians in Raleigh, and about 110 of them voted in the last municipal election. So, turnouts pretty dismal, not just. Shame on you, people. Most of them are in this room. Right. So there you go. Uh, so now I'm going to get into the finance side of things. I have data from the first finance reports uh, for all the candidates and final reports uh, that were due through June 30th of this year. Uh, for those of you that are not aware of the districts of Raleigh, uh, we talked about there's two at large seats and five districts. These are your five districts A, B, C, and D, and E. Um, uh, going back to party a little bit, um, everyone that's running in city council, I should say, most people that are running are Democrats in the city council election. If they aren't Democrat, they're usually unaffiliated. We do have, um, let's see on the next slide, it's either one or two registered Republicans running this year. Three, okay, got that wrong. Um, just a few anyway out of a couple, I think almost two dozen candidates total. Uh, some districts are more right-leaning than others. If you look at District C and D, they're probably the most left-leaning of um, the districts in Raleigh. Uh, a has probably got some of the most right-leaning people along with B, and then if you would follow that. So here's our mayor and uh, large candidates. And I'm going back, back up a little bit here and talk about why does money matter? Uh, some people say, well, why can't we just take the money out of politics? Why does it matter who raises the most money? Well, you look at Raleigh, for example, there's half a million people who live here with 303,000 registered voters. Talk about how are you going to get your message to all of those people? Well, you're not just the easy answer. You're gonna, first, you're going to target people to vote. So even those 50,000 people who voted in the last municipal election, how are you going to get your message to all of those people to try to convince them to vote for you? There's no way you can meet all of those people in the relatively short election cycle we have here in Raleigh. So you have to do some sort of paid advertising to get whether it's digital, online, or mailers, right? Um, now, it's not to say that whoever has the most money is going to win, but if you don't have, uh, if your amounts of money are drastically different, the person that has more money is, is much more likely to win, right? Now, I'll just to just give you an example, uh, in the last election, Nicole Stewart beats Stacey Miller. Nicole Stewart raised 91,000, Stacey Miller raised almost 240,000, somewhere around there. Uh, Nicole Stewart still won. So it's not to say that money is the only thing. You know, we did do a whole case study on what uh, 
Stacy Miller did wrong in his, in his campaign, but those two examples. In the mayor race, we have three people that are in the same ballpark as far as fundraising. That's Mary Ann, Charles, and Caroline. Uh, uh, so all those three, you would usually say those are the top three contenders, right? Uh, Caroline has raised more than the other two, like quite a bit. You also argue she has all her name recognition on the other two, because she's only served one term on uh, county commissioners, whereas the other two have been involved in uh, politics quite a bit. Um, we have all of them are Democrats except for Justin Sutton, who is unaffiliated. Um, I do, from what I've heard, I believe he's a little more right wing than some of the other candidates who are running for mayor. Um, under the at large race, we currently have six people running for two seats. And you can see when it comes from money, the three that are similar are Jonathan Melvin, Russ Stevenson, and Paul Stewart. Um, uh, it's pretty much expected that Nicole is probably going to keep her seat in this election, uh, as most of the challengers, if not all the challengers in the at-large race, are trying to win a seat Russ Stevenson. Um, so that's, that's the target for all these other candidates for the most part. One quick question. Sure. So the at-large, they're all on one ballot, not two. Is that that's correct. Uh, I think, uh, so, yes, the, the at large, there's two on the ballot, and you pick two. So, when you go to vote for at large, you're going to have a list of these six people, and you're going to circle them on the next the two people you want to win. Everybody in the city is going to vote for four people. They're going to vote for the mayor, two at large, and the district. Only there, yes. Yes, I like the commissioners. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I personally don't like the way that the at, at large are voted. Uh, it tends to favor the incumbents because uh, if you have more than one challenger, they just split votes against the incumbent. I'd love to see that voter just now uh, voting. That's going to be coming. Are they listed as incumbent on the ballot? No. 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 no? Okay. It's a buyout ballot. By alphabetical order. Not anymore. Um, so here's District A, B, and C. Um, District A is the only one where we don't have an incumbent running. Um, we have Sam Hershman, Patrick Buffkin, registered Democrats, and Joshua Bradley, who is the registered Green Party, but he is also, I can't remember if he's the chairperson or he's, he's very involved with the Socialist Party in North Carolina. Um, so that's. Okay, so. Uh, Joshua Bradley. Um, so as you can see there, Patrick and Sam have raised a very similar amount of money. Uh, you can delve more into this in more details, uh, but uh, one big difference here is about 18,000 to 21,000 that Sam Hershey raised came from his family members. So one note about uh, money is that an individual can give up to $5,400 to each candidate legally. So, and in Sam's case, he had about four family members that about max number of to his campaign, so that's where most of his money has come from. Uh, which isn't to say that, I mean, that could still win the election, right? But the difference is, is he going to be able to keep up that fundraising effort uh, going forward? Um, and District B, we have a Cox and Brian Fitzsimmons. You can see Brian Fitzsimmons is here tonight. They both, as of June 30th, have a very similar amount of money on hand. Um, one thing I'll call out David Cox here is that there are a few people in Raleigh that are known to give a lot of money in every election, and the number one uh, person that gives donations in Raleigh is, is Dean Devlin and his wife, Sesha Devlin. Um, he is the CEO of the work, workplace uh, here in Raleigh and has a lot of other businesses as well. But he donates the maximum amount, 10800 is about 5400 for each him and his wife, to all of his favorite candidates in each election. And uh, this election, it is David Cox, uh, and on this page, David Cox, we'll talk the other one when we get there. But so 10,800 of the 17,400 he raised came from one family. Uh, District C is a very interesting race. So Corey Branch is the incumbent here, uh, uh, but he has did almost no fundraising before June 30th. So, uh, 
Uh, I'd still say he's going to be hard to beat just because of his name recognition and, and status there in District C. He could face some pretty good competition there if uh, the others run a serious campaign. District D, um, this is Kay Crowder, is the current incumbent here. Um, so she has the most money on hand as of the most recent filing, but she didn't raise the most money. The reason she has so much cash on hand is she saved about 30000 from the last election of her account, which she didn't spend. She basically had no challenger last time, so she really didn't have to campaign to keep her, keep her seat. Um, one problem here for the people that want to get Kay Crowder off of um, the council in this case is you've got too many challengers, uh, and that can make it difficult to beat her. But you've got Brittany Bryan and Sage Martin that have both raised a, a decent amount of money, especially Sage. Um, he has been spending more money because he has campaign staff. That's why he has um, got so much more spent. Uh, April Parker, um, a registered Republican, uh, didn't raise any, basically any money before June 30th. Uh, and again, in that district, I don't think there's ever been a Republican in that district. And District E, that's where Steph Mandel is currently an incumbent. I shall have to say Kate Browder got uh, uh, money from Dean Devon as well. Um, and District E, Steph Mandel got 10800 from Dean Devon out of her 30000 And uh, David Knight raised a lot of money. So in, in any of the races, this one probably has the best chance of you seeing a flip seat. So this is Steph Mandel's first term on council. She won by technically didn't win, but she got 300 more votes than the second place person, Bonner Gable, in the last election. Uh, and Bonner could have called for Rob, but didn't. So she, she barely won that election, first term. Um, she's made some enemies over the past couple of years, so that's going to be an interesting race for her. I'd say there are some other races in my I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see all the time. Uh, so those, I think it was my last slide, so I, yeah. So that's just a little bit about where the money is in this race so far, and uh, the demographics of the votes. Uh, if we want to hold questions for the end there, we can take a call and maybe we have a moment, maybe feel free and any questions. I kind of went kind of quick, I know, because there's other people who want to talk. But, uh, any other questions? Say that again. Okay. That's not our David Tuck. Is that, that what you're asking? Yeah, it's definitely, definitely not our David Tuck. <laughs> <laughs> David Knight is uh, an attorney, um, and he actually had to quit his job to run for city council. Um, because he worked for the state, I think, is that right, Brian? Yeah, he worked for the state, and they wouldn't let him run. So he quit his job. I, I'm sure he's still doing some business on the side, but he was that dedicated to running. So, yeah. He's 50. He's about 50. I'd say he's 50. I'm hearing not quite 50 or Yeah, 50 ish. Thank you. So this is the section that could devolve into pandemonium. We're going to go over some of the issues. Um, I don't mind a few questions as we go, especially for like clarification. Um, but I, I, to keep the pace, I'd like to not spend 20 minutes on any one particular issue. At the end, we'll let it completely devolve into any kind of conversation we'd like to have. Issues and impact, we're going to talk a little bit about regulations, quality of life, property taxes, traffic, economic opportunity and growth management, because growth is what we're talking about in this area. Transportation. To talk about how our city council maybe is contrasted with others, um, Lyman Bird Scooter had about over a thousand scooters in the area in, in Raleigh, um, but not anymore. They're gone as of 31 July. Um, Raleigh City Council uh, did not like the way they were operating. And look, they presented challenges. You had a lot of people riding on sidewalks, and you had people leaving the scooters, in an area that is blocking traffic and other stuff. Um, many people will encounter, though, that that only exposed the fact that traveling around downtown on a bicycle, or on foot for that matter, can be hazardous, and that the bike lanes and other alternative transportation really didn't have any option. 
Um, so now Raleigh has one scooter, Gotcha, with about 150 scooters, I think, that are supposed to be deployed or are deploying soon. I nobody, I, I haven't seen them. They're not out yet, um, but they're going to start with like 150. Um, interesting thing for libertarians to know, um, Citric Cycle is Raleigh's program. Um, so I'm sure that nobody on council was concerned about scooters competing with a governor-run monopoly, but you know that does exist. Um, keep that in mind. And uh, keep in mind that Durham somehow managed to find a way for four different vendors to each operate 200 scooters. So somehow when I go to Durham and I'm downtown, I see scooters everywhere. In Raleigh, we uh, no more. Yes, the horror of scooters. Homestays. Homestays are basically the term for Airbnb here in Raleigh. Um, for a while, that was deadlocked. So for a while, they were technically illegal, but Raleigh City Council and the city of Raleigh were not enforcing um, any regulations or rules around homestays. Now you can have a homestay uh, for $179 a year. Um, there's this, Some people say whole house rentals are banned. They're not banned per se in some areas, in some districts they are allowed, mainly in areas where you have like mixed use in condos. Um, but there was a lot of opposition to the idea of somebody being able to rent out their whole house. Um, three of the common threads of opposition, there was concern about affordability in the sense that you were taking homes off the market as short-term rentals. Uh, you had concerns that we would become like a New York or New Orleans where you would have lots and lots, like old neighborhoods would be overrun with short-term rentals. And then it was amazing the number of people, maybe not out loud on city council during meetings, but would express a lot of concern about strangers. I mean, it was like listening to five-year-olds in stranger danger. Um, it's, it's, I, am, I, I sat in CAC meetings and it, look, people were just afraid that like pedophiles were gonna show up, it was crazy. Anyway, this is an interesting one. I, it's under discussion now and so let's talk about uh, RDU Airport Authority. It has eight members. So it is, it exists by state statute. So the state of North Carolina created RDUAA a long time ago. It's been there for some time. Wake County, Durham County, City of Durham, City of Raleigh, each appoint two members. One of those members is Dickie Thompson, the District A representative. So Raleigh City Council does, in theory, have a representative, right? Because it's one of their council members on the RDU Airport Authority. The issue now is there is a quarry there that on that property that is nearing the end of its productive life. Uh, it's about done. There is 106 acres, often referred to as the Odd Fellows Tract adjacent, um, that Wakestone would like to develop as a quarry as well. That particular part of a piece of land is close to Homestead. A lot of people ride their bicycles there. Technically, it's not part of Homestead, so that's important. It's not a state park. It is part of the land operated by the RDU Airport Authority. And they have decided to let Waco develop it. Now, there's going to be a legal challenge to that, apparently. But a couple things. This is where the growth is important, because I, I kind of put parks here with babies and puppies. Um, in the city of Raleigh, the moment you talk about a park or a woodland, it's like you're talking about babies and puppies. Um, this is one of the fastest growing areas in the country. And 50% of the aggregate that comes out of these quarries goes for roads, sewers, public buildings, what have you. Rock, this aggregate gets used to build the infrastructure. And looking at the Department of Environmental Quality, they pointed out most of it gets used within 40 miles of the quarry. And the, one of the biggest costs of moving rock around is putting in trucks, because 90% of it moves by trucks. So you often hear people talking about protecting the environment, protecting the odd fellows track. What's important to remember is if you move your source for aggregate farther and farther away from Wake County and Durham County, that means it goes on a truck and goes gets driven farther and farther and farther. So there is an economic decision here and a business decision that people should consider. I'm not even I'm not gonna try to probably get where I'm at, but I'm not gonna try to argue one way or the other too strongly. But there are economic consequences for not having a productive quarry there. There are a couple other quarries in the area, but they're getting used up too. Brian. Right. Right. 
RDU Airport Authority has ownership of that land. That's part of their program. It's theirs. It's always been there. So the odd fellows track where the people riding their bicycles are technically trespassing. Nobody's ever bothered to say anything because. Yes, it is next to an adjacent court. It's been in operation, I think, for about 40 years, roughly. And so that it's important to consider that because, like I said, I mean, these things that we're building, you know, highways, you know, expanding, we'll get into it. There's a lot of construction, and that, that material does get used, and it gets more and more expensive to move it from somewhere else. I mean, the airport is the second fastest growing in the country as well, and they want to put in a third runway, like 11,000 feet long, that will support international travel to China. So, any other quick questions? What, what happens to the quarry when it's exhausted? It is supposed to be rehabilitated, and that's the other thing that you bring up on four point. Technically, the quarry it would not be sold. Waitstone would be leasing the quarry. Um, I have not to make light of it, but I've been told that quarries usually, when they're done, fill with water and become lakes. I believe that's yeah. Really, I mean, you can develop the area around it, but I mean, it's going to become a lake. So there, there are legitimate concerns about developing the quarry there. Um, but part of the conversation, one of the reasons, and I'm saying on this one longer. The other three municipal parties involved don't even really be terribly interested in stopping this. Raleigh City Council is deadlocked four to four. There is a group that is using this as a campaign issue because, again, I make light of it, but parks are like babies and puppies in Raleigh. And they want people to vote to stop the quarry, even though it's very dubious that they would be able to accomplish that. So, anyway, it's enough on the quarry. Hit the button. Here we go. Another issue, keep in mind, top motor issue is traffic. Many of the roads in Raleigh are actually state roads. So just pointing that out, whether it's you know NC 50, 70, whether there's going to be improvements at Capitol Boulevard north of 540. And remember, because of the lawsuit around the MAP Act and the struggles of NCDOT paying for the hurricane. Um, Funding is going to be short, and we are growing fast. So there are the transportation budget is separate than the state's general fund. So a continuing strain. Many people want to try to restrain growth until development catches up. Uh, it's highly unlikely that the people who build the roads will get ahead of the growth in the number of people moving here. <laughs> Bus rapid transit. There was a bond in 2016. And we are now beginning to actually move forward. It looks along Newber and Avenue, I think, is the first area that's going to get bus rapid transit. For those that are not familiar with that, that means a lane for cars goes away. It becomes dedicated for bus. The bus comes by, I think, every 15 minutes is the goal. And it's sort of like a poor man's light rail, um, but it has worked in some areas across the country, and it is a little cheaper. And I will point out it's a little easier to go back and adjust and fix, whereas if you put light rail in, and you didn't get it right, you really can't undo that. And I will also point out, we may have actually got this part. I'm just going to real quickly. Um, so in that opportunity, I won't say it exists because of, but one of the incentives for that is uh, the Trump administration, the Republicans in 2017, through their tax act, I can't the tax act and job cuts, or not job cuts, tax. That <laughs> <laughs> sounds like I got the wrong party with that one, sorry. Um, Jobs Act and tax cuts. Basically, 2017, huge incentives, capital gains for development areas that are labeled as economically disadvantaged or depressed. And so, a part, there's 252 of these zones in the state of North Carolina, and one of them is in South Raleigh. And so, the developers would like to go in there and put in mixed use and hotels and a soccer stadium. Uh, one of the things they also want are interlocal funds. This is a tourism tax, I'll be corrected if I get this wrong, but that can only be used for other things relating to tourism. And that's what this would hope to do. So you have a lot of voters who wanted to take that money and instead of using it for this, go spend it on affordable housing or parks. And that's not how the law is written, so you can't do that. I don't know what else to say other than you can't do that, that's not allowed. Um, it does look like yesterday they decided to spend a lot of the interlocal funds on PNC Arena. And upgrades for that. Um, but if that goes through, you know, it's a tax incentive for an area, and that it would be rapid development in that area. 
And it's not too far from Dick's Park, with those of you who don't remember, it was a $52 million investment. Um, much like Deepak and Durham was $48 million, you spent $52 million on a park, you're going to attract people who want to be near the super nice new park. So we'll see how that changes South Raleigh over the next 10 years. Accessory dwelling units, uh, Jacob Rogers, I know you're familiar with this issue. Um, basically, real quick, this is a granny flat. Somebody wants to build a little small mini home in their backyard. Uh, in Durham, you can just do this by right. There have been tons of them. But in Raleigh, you're required, and it's still developing, uh, I think, the details of the ordinance, but you have to get an overlay history. So you have to go convince your neighbors within 10 acres that you should become this area that allows accessory dwelling units. You can also choose those 10 acres. You can gerrymander your own. You, you can. So they've allowed, so this is unique. Uh, Plus, that brings up a good point. You as the individual can gerrymander yourself those 10 acres and take them to the city. So any of you who are interested in gerrymandering and want to get even government, go try it yourself. <laughs> um, uh, key is the only area that's perhaps considering this. Um, but look, again, this is, you know, you don't get the property rights. And this hurts, oddly enough, a lot of the people who get harmed by this are existing homeowners who would like to scale down, they're on fixed income, they're older now, their house is too big or what have you, and they might move into the 80s themselves or rent it out to a uh, you know, college student or a single person. So again, less housing, less opportunity. Zoning and affordability. This is, I'm not going to, I can't spend too much time on this because it, it gets complicated, but it, it's complicated by design. But really, what Raleigh does is decide, the city council decides who gets to build what where. Um, and some of the tools, they have a future land use map, they take citizen in, input, they have their planning department, and they have Raleigh City Council, and they try to predict what should go where over the coming years. They have a comprehensive plan. And then they have the Unified Development Ordinance, which is the current law, which says that you can build where. All of this goes to affordability, and it makes it challenging during rezone. So, for example, if you're on the edge of downtown and you're only allowed to build a 20-story building, and the market comes to you and says, I can build a 40-story building and fill with people, it is Raleigh City Council that gets to decide if you can have 40 stories of building. Or if in an area that's zoned, for example, R6, six residential units per acre, you can go R10 and put in condos. So in an area with rapid growth, people need housing. And Jake, you talk, I'm not going to steal too much of your thunder here, but uh, you know, look, if you can't build, things go. This is a supply and demand. So for a lot of young people who say, oh, I want to find a house, but I can't find an affordable one here in Raleigh, and I'm going to move to Nightdale or Clayton or some area farther outside the city. A lot of that has to do with the opportunities we create here in Raleigh for film creating. Gentrification will be a hot issue. I don't have a sheet of paper with a definition in front of me. Uh, there are as many definitions as there are people. Um, but gentrification, you're usually talking about newcomers or affluent newcomers moving into an area generally at a fairly rapid pace. It creates all kinds of tension people that are coming into the area may build new stuff and displace renters. Um, in some areas will be a component where a significant number of maybe more affluent younger whites are moving into a traditionally African American neighborhood and that displacement and that cultural change creates real tension. Uh, the city had an event in June on gentrification and one of the discussions was, you know, newcomers not really integrating well with the neighborhood calling the police perhaps at times when they should not have or, you know, calling your neighbor for being your neighbor is not really uh, a way to build bridges. Which goes to a little bit of law enforcement. Uh, one of the issues is always pay for public workers, police in particular, uh, are looking for pay raises because a lot of them now can't afford to live in the city themselves. And there's also a very active group, but very small, that is trying very hard to get a police oversight and accountability board. Um, my one discussion with somebody on city council is they don't seem to be willing to budge on some of their demands. I'm not sure if that will happen, but they are active and organized. And this, as we wrap up my section, neighborhood conservation overlay district. I can't tell you about anything I hate more on earth 
And we have some days over with this. Um, in all seriousness, what this allows is a small group of politically active and organized neighbors to create an area and get the city through the Unified Development Ordinance to say no more development here. Um, and the most recent one, which was actually in the North area, in North Raleigh, where I met Dickie Thompson, whose district is District A, actually said they're designed to preserve the character and integrity of a neighborhood. Um, if certain other people in the NCJ had said that, we might have seen that for the loaded and coded language that it is. Um, but that's just my opinion. It takes it takes a lot of organization to get done. It favors those who are acting, and by creating these, you basically limit any new growth or housing or change in the neighborhood. So the existing homeowners see the value of their property go up. It limits growth and opportunity. And because of who is organizing this, and Robbie pointed it out with the older organized whiter homeowners, it really is a pretty ugly thing in my opinion. Uh, the one near me, um, they were zoned R6, which would have allowed duplexes. There were duplexes on the other side of Northridge Elementary. Um, you could just look at the demographics of who rented and was in those duplexes and in that neighborhood. And uh, yeah. I, I mean, main neighborhoods, yeah. It's a, yeah it's a, zoning, a zoning regulation is in many ways a wall to keep newcomers out. It's, it's, it's using the law to say you can't change. And again, you, you need to remember the horror we're stopping in that case. We're often stopping duplexes uh, or a lot from being subdivided. You know, it, it's very much targeted in many cases against renters and younger people trying to find something more smaller. And it's, I'm going to turn this up. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to cover this slide. I'm going to give this to Jacob and come back to this slide. Anyway, I talked too long probably, and I apologize for that. With that, tell us how you're going to fix all that. My name is Jacob Rogers. I'm the CEO of the Triangle Community Coalition. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, we're celebrating our 20th year this year. And that's uh, it's a little abnormal because usually coalitions uh, never last this long. You, you band together, you uh, get together, you find an issue or you bring an issue to the table or support an issue, you win or lose and then you disband. And so what happened back in 1999, uh, there was a group of industry professionals and business leaders that said, we've got to uh, fight this growing nimbyism and anti-growth. And so they formed this group and they hired somebody and we were uh, pretty successful in the first four or five years. And we won several of the issues that we had Thought, and the, the group got together. I see Hannah back there doing a little. The, her boss was uh, was our first CEO, and um, we wanted it. They got it. The stakeholders got together and said, "Hey, do right, right, we need to continue this?" And they said, "Absolutely." So we got more involved in Raleigh and uh, played in that field. Of course, then the downturn came, and uh, just like any other real estate organization, uh, we barely uh, slipped by. We maintained staff through. Of the downturn, and then uh, uh, had the conversation again. Do we continue? And the answer was yes. And then they hired me in 2014. <laughs> I uh, this has been uh, a great job. I actually really enjoy it uh, more than any other job I've had. But there's a couple of things I want to mention that, that David had mentioned with Dix Park. We have an incredible opportunity that we will not have again with with this piece of land. And we've got to have the bold vision and the leadership to maximize the potential of this park. Uh, we do not have it and will not have it with this council. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Okay, so uh, talking about TCC a little bit further, we are, there's two words to get out of this signet, uh, sentence land use, our purpose is land use policy, and we advocate for property. property. Everything we do through advocacy, through education, through connecting, all has to do with land use and private property rights. So I always like to include this because these, uh, a lot of these folks on this list are uh, community leaders. Many of you may know uh, Mason Williams, if you're not familiar with him, developed and, and uh, owned a ton of land in North Raleigh. If you live in North Raleigh, chances are he developed or built your house. Uh, 
Um, Gordon Grubb with the Carolinian and Grant Clifford of Coral Lynn Overland has done many great projects inside the belt line. Eric Braun is a past chairman. He was uh, the immediate past chair of the uh, Raleigh Planning Commission. Uh, Ryan Akers is our chair this year. Tom Anthub was a couple years ago. Uh, Tom developed Briar Creek uh, and, and several of these other folks. Some of our partnerships, I mentioned uh, the groups got together back in 99 and decided to start this coalition. And these are some of them. Uh, today, our, our membership is much more diverse than just developers and builders and builders. We've got uh, utility providers, financial institutions, insurance companies, anybody interested in land use. We've got major landowners uh, land all throughout this area who want to know uh, and want to be involved in the future of the property. So I want to talk about a few facts uh, before we get into many of the issues. And here we are. I'm going to try not to go through each one of these, but Wake County grows approximately 60 people a day. We've heard that. The Triangle overall is adding 100 daily. Uh, Raleigh's population is approximately 480,000. That's the 42nd largest town or city in the country. And then we'll go through some numbers. This is fascinating. So it was, uh, our population was 406,000 in 2010, an increase of over 18% since, uh, uh, since 2010, so it's, we added 74,000 people. Population was 276,000 in 2000, an increase of 47% from 20, 2000 to 2010. It was uh, 207,000 in 1990, an increase of 33% from 90 to 2000. It was 150,000 in 1980, and it was a 38% increase from 80 to 1990, uh, which was about 57,000 additional people. This is another interesting fact. We talked about land use. 77.5% of residentially zoned land in Raleigh. So everything that's currently zoned from residential, not office industrial, not retail, is uh, zoned single family detached. 14.6% zone multifamily, 5% residential townhome, uh, duplex, 2.7% manufactured group living. And, and David touched on something that I, I mega hate as well is the uh, neighborhood conservation overlay districts in COD. There are currently 19, and I, and I believe the 20th was discussed or heard before planning commission or council a couple weeks ago. So hopefully that just doesn't move forward. But basically, these have frozen the, the areas, uh, their, their ability to add more housing. And the prevalence of single family zoning and NCODs restrict Raleigh's ability to absorb the growing population and absolutely uh, contribute to sprawl. I also want to mention the university enrollment. This is, this is a pretty big thing. The big three. So 72,000 total students in 2007, which increased to 81,000 in 2017. Percent increase in 10 years. Today, there are a total of over 127,000 undergrad degree programs and graduate students in the Raleigh Durham area. That's a lot. The median age in Raleigh is 32 and a half, on the national average is 36.8. 49% of adults in Raleigh have at least a four year uh, college degree compared to the national average of 32%. Uh, a couple other numbers I'm going to talk about. I've actually got another slide on this. In 2000, approximately 12,000 homes, uh, this means townhomes and condominiums as well, were built in the Triangle. That number increased to 17,000 in 2007, before dropping almost 75% to 4,900 in 2009 in the heart of the recession. Last year, we closed at 12,500 homes. We're Returning to 2,000 levels, even though the Triangle's population has grown by a third since then, the area is actually building less homes than it needs. Uh, we have, we do have a housing supply issue. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Home ownership. How many of you uh, have rented before? And we're not even we're not bad people either. <laughs> it's really amazing. Uh, home ownership. Uh, I know you. Uh, the U.S. banks at 68.9% before the recession, and it dropped 6% to 64.8% in 2018. Raleigh's homeownership rate was 55.6% before the recession, and it is 49.1% uh, today. So that means a little over half of our residents quit. 
a little bit more, you know, uh, I always tell people when I talk about uh, our industry, the development industry, that nobody moves to Raleigh because there's a new subdivision going in or a nice apartment community over here. Uh, we don't move in. I moved here from Birmingham, Alabama about six years ago. I moved here for a job. I couldn't even point out Raleigh on a map seven years ago. Uh, all I knew is I had a job that paid a, few, a little bit more money. Uh, and there was opportunity here, and it brought me here. And I thought, well, maybe stay here two or three years, and I'll move on. Uh, and it's been six. So one of the things I find interesting, I just just kind of breaks it down, and I think a couple of the words have been um, cut off there. Personal business services are definitely uh, the highest there. This is a year over year increase. Price trends. Uh, this is interesting too. So the average sale price right now is uh, three hundred twenty-seven thousand. In June of twenty seventeen, so two years ago, it was three hundred one. So that's a pretty big increase in these two years. Uh, quarter two, twenty nineteen sales. This is for home sales. Quarter two, the triangle MLS. So this is triangle wide. Thirteen thousand two hundred thirty-six homes sold. Uh, and there's a breakdown between existing and new homes. That's a, that's a pretty big number. And then, so uh, quarter two of twenty eighteen. Uh, we actually sold more homes than quite a few more. So, uh, talk about selling homes, affordability. Uh, I've got to talk about zoning. Uh, there's going to become a day, and I think it's going to be in the next 10 years, where we look at zoning as draconian ways of, of, of building a city or of maintaining an area. You think the, the reason zoning started was to keep industrial there and residential and, and other services over here. And in the 50s and 60s, we decided it was a great idea to uh, draw in places where you can allow this type of housing here for this type of people, and this type of housing, and this type of uh, place for other people. Um, and it's blatantly racist in a lot of ways. And this is still practiced today. And we do in, in cities and a lot of places don't grasp that, that we are using zoning in that way. So you look at, um, and when we talk about affordability, I was on the Wayne County Affordable Housing Steering Committee a couple of years ago, and I, along with 31 other people who um, were experts in this field, we got to talk, and the first thing they said, well, we need inclusionary zoning, we need to, we need to get uh, more money to, to just pay for it. And I was like, yeah, I see it. It's bullshit. No. Uh, Right. It's outlawed in North Carolina, and as long as I'm still breathing, I will make sure it continues to be outlawed. That's not the way. In every market, the inclusionary zoning, which means, if you're not familiar with inclusionary zoning, it's uh, when a developer pays money, extra money per unit, five, eight, ten, twenty thousand dollars per door, for an affordable housing pot of money. Uh, and actually, in every market, it makes housing more expensive. Every market. They're in, I, I've heard that Montgomery County in Maryland has the right cure. No, they don't. <laughs> it, is, it, it doesn't work. So uh, one of the things that we said is that if we want a lasting impact with affordability, if we really want to tackle this program, or this problem, we've got to look at current zoning. And so if you look at, that actually is the number one problem coming out of the affordable housing plan. So if you ever see Presentation by the county. They always have their slides. The first thing at the top of what now comes up is regulation reform. It's never numbered, but it's always bulleted and it's always at the top, and that's the main thing. The county has no jurisdiction over the municipalities for their land use codes. It's basically saying, We hope you do this. Uh, there was a lot of work that went in that. It's a great plan. We're hoping that more of the uh, other Boyd County municipalities would look at this. But Durham is, I, I live in Durham. I'm very involved in Durham. I'm the chair of the Board of Adjustment in Durham. I've sat on the, um, the Confederate Monuments Committee in Durham. When the uh, monument fell, I was on the Appearance Commission. I've, I've been on, um, I'm on board for Go Triangle from them. And Durham actually has a different, I won't mention this because it's, it's worth mentioning, we've got a different culture in Durham than we do in Raleigh. And City Hall is very well connected to the community. Where in Raleigh, we've got uh, adversity, and actually a breakdown in relationships between council members and their staff, the staff and the city, and the electorate. So you've got council members here in Raleigh who have decided that it's their, their priority to micromanage staff, to not trust them to actually do the job. 
And so they, they're reprimanded for so, and, and the staff even make a, a real a good decision and is within their realm. They get, a council member can get mad, and you've seen this with David Cox multiple times. But it has it, it is lost this vision, and also it's also created a culture within the city that is um, it, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's actually rained them out, and we're not, we're not growing. There is no vision, but if you look at Durham, the city council respects their staff. They understand that they have the expertise needed to get the job done, and they know their role. They know that their role is to set the vision and the priorities for the city. They know that the staff is there to, to, to implement that and, and keep it going. And they're also in the community saying, hey, we have the best staff. You don't see that in Raleigh. So Durham is much more connected to the community. And so one of the things that they're talking about, they've got a you know, $95 million affordable housing bond on the ballot this fall. So they're not only collecting money to figure out how to, to serve the poorest of the poor, they're also saying, you know, we're also going to look at Arizona because we know that's screwed up too. Expanding housing choices is just as progressive as what Minneapolis has done, Atlanta, uh, places out in Portland and Oregon and California. But it's not that, it's not that hard, it's not that hard to fathom. Allows duplexes by right throughout the urban tier. Right? Allowing larger ADUs up to 30, well, up to 800 square foot, even if that primary structure is 1,200 square foot. Right? Reducing minimum lot sizes, reducing setbacks for ADUs. Uh, why, what about a crazy thing of allowing smaller homes and smaller lots? Um, all of this is going to be by right, and this is how the market takes care of some of the affordability issues. Raleigh doesn't allow any of this action. I don't know what the places are allowed by right. Raleigh. I, accessory dwelling is, is a joke. The process here is a joke. You're not, we haven't seen, I don't, I'd love to know if there's been one, but I know there hasn't, so that has been one bit. So, um, lot sizes, if you went to the city council and asked for a reduced lot size, they would laugh. So, uh, Durham is getting it right. And this is one of the cases where I used to say that, well, you know, you look at Raleigh's UDO, it's a good thing to do. And now I'm finding myself going back, of course, and pinching dirt on someone who's doing it right and making sure. But this right here is going to help the building. I uh, take some questions, and I know that's hopefully that wasn't too long, maybe. About zoning or something. Yes, sir. Um, most of the conversation has been about zoning, or about zoning has been about residential. Do you have any thoughts about uh, commercial zoning? Well, uh, basically, what are some thoughts on uh, commercial zoning? Uh, give me, give me a little bit more. What do you think? What do you, what are you asking? There's a lot of areas of, of uh, the main roads that could be commercial for uh, for retail. Um, in particular, I used to run a retail store, but I'm doing that now. But um, it was very hard to find good uh, retail spaces. Now that's less true now. Uh, with the internet and everything making retail less uh, competitive, but still, uh, there are a lot of places where if you if you own a real estate office, a lawyer's office, a dentist's office, no problem at all. But if you want to put a retail spot there, right next to another retail spot, you can't do it. Right. Things like that. So uh, retail's not dead, right? I mean, retail's changed a little more experience-driven, uh, and that's why. Balls are changing. There's a lot of what's happening there. But let's give an example. We did a program last year where we about BRT and we brought in the guys from Richmond and we said, hey, Richmond just started this BRT. How did you do it? What are some best practices? And we brought down their uh, planning director. Uh, Mark is his name. And Mark said, along the BRT lines, they are they buy right 10 stores within a quarter of, I think, either a half mile or a quarter mile from. Those, uh, uh, those lines. That's, that's huge. What, what's a BRT? BRT, bus rapid transit. So, what uh, David was talking about, dedicated bus lines for this, they uh, New Bern, uh, Capitol Boulevard, and Western. Any others? I hope that answers some of it. Not really. <laughs> well, I'm saying that we've got to, if, if we're going to have BRT be a, a, a viable option of transit, we've got to also look at these areas. For zoning and say mixed use is a great place for yeah. bus rapid transit to promote bus rapid transit. The more you get people there walking and moving around, 
then we use that, that mode of transportation. And retail is one of those ways you can promote a lot of this. So you are, you are supporting the notion that the city should determine where retail is uh, based on these objectives, these planning objectives, as opposed to letting the market decide. No, not at all, actually. Uh, my personal belief is let the market decide on that. But we have identified where these BRT lines need to be. We based on number of people, based on traffic, and there's a lot of opportunities along those areas to, to make it a, a better use. And that's what I, I would say is that now, if we're going to if we're going to if we're going to have this as a viable transportation option, we need to support it in other ways as well, with retail, commercial, even residential. So why, that's what I'm talking about from, from Richmond is that they're allowing the, these types of mixed-use developments all down that corridor, which will support retail and commercial. Yes, sir. Specifically for BRT, I, I was part of the, I guess it's maybe more of a comment than a question, part of the community discussion group about BRT in the city um, at Sicletti staff at, as well as Steph Mandel and a couple other city council folks were at. And uh, they specifically said that along the BRT corridors, they're going to do their best to maintain the character of those neighborhoods. And so, uh, one of my questions was, how do you, uh, how do you actually make BRT efficient if you also are going to have like low density residential uh, in those neighborhoods, which is pretty much the opposite of what you need for BRT? So, so, so. Uh... <laughs> Raleigh's going to change, right? We're growing. I mean, change is inevitable. And it's taken, if you look at Raleigh over, over a time period, I mean, it took bold leadership to, to buy Dick's Park. I mean, that was $52 million four years ago, but it was, you know, I think it's four. That was a big deal. And, but it affords us an incredible opportunity. It's going to take even bolder leadership to implement that and make its maximum potential. Just like it took bold leadership to, to create RTP or uh, Centennial Campus, things have changed and we've grown because we have been, uh, we have accepted change and said, we're going to, our, our priorities are this and people, and so we have we accommodated that. This, this notion of we've got to protect every neighborhood and the character of, of everything the way it is now is. Uh, we won't be this growing area that that idea continues. I mean, we won't be having jobs announced all the time. People are companies are looking at Raleigh and saying, I don't know, maybe that's I, I, this is you can talk any economic development, yeah, the, the demand is here, but is that vision and that leadership here? You know, it's like 40 stories in downtown. Why can't what is the deal with why is that even a question? Why are we even talking about stories? Just, if the market can accommodate 60 stories, then where the hell else are we going to put that kind of answer? Well, well, yes? I would say, part of the issue is that the market has four stories, four stories, four stories, and there's, uh, and there's very few stores. You can find you know, four large stores in the Raleigh area. There are some coming in. But if you're going to support uh, baby boomers who are downsizing and millennials who are where they are, you, you need some. Like Northville's environment where people have stores to go to bars, to go to restaurants, to go to as opposed to come and take one of the But my son worked in Seattle, in Seattle with Amazon, and um, I happen to know that one of the biggest issues with Raleigh was lack of infrastructure. And that becomes an issue because Raleigh Durham is more open sometimes to making changes, but Raleigh gets this up in the mud between people who don't want to make any changes, people want to change everything, nothing gets changed, and then you have companies moving in. That are larger than say Red Hat, and they're like, there's no infrastructure. So you have to get past that constant need to argue with new things. So at some point, make a plan and as well. When you say there's no infrastructure, what do you mean? No roads? No sewer? Housing isn't an
So we, we think about planning a little differently than today than we have before, right? I mean, you think about North Raleigh, it's all uh, car driven. You know, why would you walk down? Um, yeah. Well, but that wasn't put in. Being, so you look at today the way we think about development is that, especially the infrastructure is there. Uh, if we're talking about uh, water, sewer, uh, roads, the infrastructure is abundantly there. Uh, Durham has had some issues. They have made incredible uh, investments in their infrastructure to accommodate what's been going on in downtown Durham, where they can accommodate uh, two or three times of what they have. Now, if, if you're talking about sidewalks, that's all been incorporated into the way we develop and then you know, by development ordinance, make sure that every the experience is walkable and then you can now. Uh, but they are also only, you know, well, depending on certain areas. Amazon, Amazon gives us, I know this because I know Amazon gives their employees access to uh, Amazon Prime and they it's all people that own homes or renting homes, they're doing their work, they're online, they're playing around. It's and they, and they don't get a right back, they say Uber and they go with a couple of friends and they do the share a car thing. So, you know, things like that are important when you think about a large company moving here. And then there are buses in Raleigh, which I think sometimes. The bus runs once an hour. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's and that's 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 I, I completely agree with you on that. I mean, we're behind the ball on the transit conversation. I mean, just with it, just now passing it. Well, now it's been three years, and we're getting to the implementation of it finally. Uh, it's going to take some time to finish that out. It's, you know, we should have been on that a decade before. I agree with you. Hi, sir. My name is Rich. I'm part of observer today. I'm just moving to the city. Uh, okay, oh, wow. actually. Thank you. Um, I think you mentioned the fact that there is more demand for housing than flat. Is there a specific angle from either the uh, city commission or the local government whether or not the supply should be higher, in which case prices will drop, obviously? Or is it kind of, is it, is it, uh, Free trade, in that sense, is an incentive for developers to build more buildings, or is it kind of like keeping it at a status quo of keeping prices where they are? Where do they want to be in this situation as far as increasing supply and building massive amounts of houses compared to what it is? At a city council level, that conversation hasn't happened. At the county commission level, yes. Have with the affordable housing security committee at the county level, that was talked about quite a bit. Probably you probably can talk about this too in some of your experience. Uh, this I won't say that. that uh, I think there is a uh, an under. I think there is a thought that we're not under supply by some of these. Uh, under uh, we, yeah, we're not under supply with some of these councils. They believe that where we are is okay. Um, and it's, you know, prices are too high because we're charging too much. Yeah, I love it. Here you go. No use. Okay. Um, the current council probably is closed doors, but admit there is a housing supply issue. But they don't want more people to move here, so they're going to essentially ignore the problem. Uh, but I mean, the data is clear. There's an housing supply issue. Actually, I just submitted an op-ed on this week that served the days. I'm just going to elaborate. <laughs> um, so the housing supply in Raleigh, measured by Triangle MLS, has gone from 2012. We had 13 months of supply of houses on the market. Supply is the number of houses for sale divided by how many sell. Right? For the past two years, we've covered just under two months of supply. And that's about statistically as low as it can go. Um, he gave numbers there about how many new homes are being built and how that number hasn't changed since the early 2000s, essentially. Yet our population has increased tremendously. Our apartments in Raleigh, the occupancy rate citywide is over 95%. That basically means we can build apartments and we just rent. Um, you know, we just can't argue that we 
have enough housing for sale. It's more just do they want to admit that's a problem and do they care? And most of us that are right against my case is where the people that are right against the current council we're just think they, they don't want those people to move here, but they'd rather just people that are right. Thank you. Thank you. So you told us earlier that you were going to explain why the present city council is not properly equipped to make the good decisions regarding X Park, but I don't think you ever came back to that. Sure. Can you, does anybody know? Uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, be, I'll take you to lunch if you have this to answer this question. Does anybody know what the vision for Raleigh is on this council? So no one is I don't even know if it's a, if it's a real vision. <laughs> and that, that's, a, that's a huge problem. We've got council members who are community activists, and quite frankly, community activists don't make good elected officials. Two more questions, and I'm going to wrap it up. Both Brian, Brian Williams, and Brian Herman. Jacob, glad to see you. Yes, sir. Uh, my question has to deal with uh, sort of a carbon, uh, carbon force question. When we discuss ERT, we know that we need higher densities uh, to fill it in for it to at least cover some fraction of its cost. Uh, in terms of planning towards future, the the subsidization question comes into play. We borrowed a whole bunch of money to pay for the DRT. We borrowed them. a bond issue is nothing more than debt that we're going to pay back in the future with interest from taxpayers in the future. We sell them as though they're these really pretty good packages. Is there a plan laid out where that higher density recoups in its value? Because I don't know that that actually exists, I don't think it has ever existed. Where the later tax revenue covers the cost of the payback of the investment. It's a great investment because we build pretty things, but we don't cover the cost of the pretty things with what we gain from it. And in that, and the uh, adjacent question becomes uh, if I wish to take my acreage and I want to divide it up and share, the burden of cost to the community at large, because I take what was two traffic trips a day from my property and then choose to turn it to four traffic trips a day is, a, is an impact fee uh, question. Is whether or not we use those to cover forward capital costs in your view. So, um, quite frankly, the, the first question, I don't know. Um, we, and it's actually the reason that the question we asked to Richmond, set up Mark, I wish I could remember his last song, uh, was, and that's one of the reasons they sell these corridors as they did is to recapture some of that. Obviously, commercial developments pay more than property taxes and residential than a single family home or a mixed use. It's quite a bit. Um, yeah, we, we have impact fees here. And those are, uh, since we're dealing with state, you have to have the authority to collect those from the, uh, from the General Assembly, and Raleigh has that authority, uh, and they do. Uh, that's more or less for the cost of, of maintaining most stuff rather than recouping costs in a lot of ways. Um, but the question has always been, does growth pay for itself? Uh, yes. Some people could say maybe not. I say yes. Uh, think of what the, the, the benefits of what that what comes of that compared to what could what wasn't there. So, sorry to have to answer one question. Well, I want to ask a question about gentrification and neighborhood conservation overland issues, but I've had to comment about the, the uh, lack of housing in the area. Kind of interesting because I live in West of Cary, spelled C A R I, and I'll tell you what that means later. Um, and there's condos and apartments going up everywhere. Now, and, and you've talked in the, today about Durham and Raleigh, but you're really talking about the triangle, so, is it, so is, is it really Raleigh's problem or is it the, the county's problem or the state's problem if there's a lack of housing in the area? That's a, that's a, that's a really good question. That's one thing that we don't, uh, 
We've got, I think, like 12 municipalities in Wake County. Every, each one of them is very distinct. Morrisville is not impact. So impact is in Wake Forest. Uh, and you, you know that they both have identities. Um, at the same time, there isn't enough regional conversations about going on, going on about uh, growth and then housing as a whole. I've been advocating for like uh, about three years ago. I think it was three or four years ago, the Raleigh Chamber did an inner city visit. We went to San Diego. And I was sitting next to uh, Jennifer Robinson, who is you're probably your town council person in uh, Cary. Uh, if she, she represents Western from Cary. We got to talk about this for a while. And she said, yeah, I'm actually the chair of uh, Triangle J Council of Governments. And I was like, wow, cool, cool. And, and we went to this trip, came back, and oddly enough, we were sitting beside each other on the plane again. And we got to talk about what did we take away from it, that, that trip. One of the things was is that in San Diego, their council of governments is called SANDAG, uh, it's some kind of acronym. But basically, they have taken a leadership role in convening all of the municipalities and saying, uh, Raleigh just doesn't, you know, San Diego doesn't just have the, the uh, housing affordability issue. It's all of us around here, this whole region. And thinking regionally, how can they address affordability? And so we, I left and said, why, why don't we do the same? You know, is, is the COG not playing that part? And so on the ride back, I said, can you get Triangle J to play, to be that intermediary, to bring all of us together, bring all, I mean, they actually represent 13 of the 16 counties, but bring in the, together the triangle communities and say, well, how can we how can we address this as a region as it does, rather than just saying, this is what we're going to do each municipality. Um, so she sat up, and she, we actually sat down for lunch with Lee Worsley, who's their executive director. Three of us had lunch, and he's basically said, well, we don't have the capacity right now. That's not the right question, and then, or the right answer. And a couple years later, we did the Affordable Housing Steering Committee, and they were very involved, and they've been very involved, just not at the level they should be. Um, there's resources like that, and we ought, they ought to be playing more of a leadership role for the region um, rather than um, acting more as an association for the municipalities. That's, that's just my thoughts. Can I ask one last question? I'm not sure if that's what you meant, or honestly, you said it was. Yeah. That's exactly the mentality. Would you agree, Ryan? I'd say those two things are the same. They don't care. They are sitting somewhere else. They don't want to hear about it. So I was at a, uh, one of our local CAC meetings. You're actually in the same area. This is an advisory. And you know what? The people to, to Robbie's point about who shows up and votes. I literally had a lady afterwards go, We just have too many low income people in our neighborhood area. <laughs> oh. Like she literally just, you know, they were talking about putting town homes in an area, and she's just like, Hey, there's already too many. She literally basically said there's too many low income people up in the Wakefield area. So, no, that was her stance. Um, and she would like them to go anywhere. Again, the definition of NIMBY is anywhere but where she's at. Um, but Brutal, you know, my blood pressure. See if I get the thing to go backwards. No, but this, so I, I, I do, you know, the reason I wanted to, thank you, Jake, that was fantastic. That was fantastic. <laughs> I want to tie some of this together for us. You now, this is a slide where it's libertarian, and so Robbie talked about who showed up and votes, and it's city council elections. It is in older, whiter homeowner that is most politically active. However, in those off years, and especially in presidential cycles, you get everybody. And you have people that, you know, want to hear how their lives can be a little bit better with a policy change. And people are struggling now as prices rise fairly rapidly, not just in Raleigh, but across the triangle. There is a divide, so let's remember, whether it's County Board of Commissioners, Wake County School Board, City of Raleigh, the area is run by Democrats, so running against the Republicans or talking about that, I'm not sure, is really productive. There are, Minneapolis 2040, that area is dominated by the Democratic Party. Oregon is run by the Democrats. California is run by the Democrats. Oregon was huge this year. At a state level, if you want to talk about policy change, they abolished single-family housing as a zoning in Oregon. 
So I'm going to I'm going to tell this group if you want to carry a message forward, and I have a few candidates who are going to try this because I'm adamant about this. You have government deciding who gets to live where and what they can have. If you wanted to buy progressives, younger progressives, I mean, look, we should embrace it. You have young progressives now in places like Oregon and California embracing market solutions. For saying we need less land use and regulation, we need greater opportunity to build, we need less government so we can put in duplexes, triplexes, brownstone. These are young Democrats who are trying to embrace market solutions. If we don't understand that as a group, and begin to leverage that and educate people, we're missing an opportunity here. Because there really is a difference. Cynthia Ball is in the North Carolina General Assembly, House 49. You go to any event where Cynthia Ball is in attendance, she will talk about her love of the North Carolina Association of Educators, she will talk about public schools, but she will also harp on diversity in our public schools. You call her out though on diversity in neighborhoods, and it's a different ball game, because she is one of those people that donates to Russ Stevenson, she is one of those people that benefits from a high home price in her nice neighborhood. She'll talk about diversity in schools. She doesn't have school-aged children. You want to talk about diversity in her neighborhood and allowing, you know, duplexes and triplexes and condos to go anywhere near, that soon changes quick. There is a real dividing line and a real wedge that we can take advantage of between younger Democrats who feel like they're being denied opportunity, basically everybody under 40 in this area, because the housing prices are rising so rapidly. And the kind of people that I go to in meetings and say, we have too many low-income people near us. And if we don't begin to appreciate that and exploit that opportunity in 2020 as part of our messaging, I really think we're missing a vote. It's a wonderful opportunity because anytime somebody who's younger, I don't care if they're using our language or not, wants to embrace a solution where the market solves the problem through less regulation, we have got to take advantage of that. So anyway, um, I'll take a few questions and I'm also going to give, do you want to have a moment to speak? Mike, close to your mouth. Rogers. James, uh, Mike, close to your mouth. Sorry, my apologies. Mike, think it's Rogers over here. Uh, he touched on every bit of my housing plan. Uh, I am glad that I'm actually talking to you tonight because my entire platform is based on liberty. I want you to have the liberty to build what you want. I want you to have the liberty to do whatever you want in your backyard. It's not my place to tell you what you do. It's your backyard. You do what you want with it. If you want to build an APU, I would like you to build by right. I want you to have that right if you want to take care of your grandma in your backyard and have an ADU back there, great. If you want to house college students because it's impossible for them to get an apartment back there, go get it. It's your land, do what you want with it. Uh, in regards to housing, yes, that can solve our problem with how much debt we are in. We are in a lot of debt. We have a great bond rating, but we are just spending money left and right like a 25-year-old that just got a black credit card from daddy. I want to take care of that by diversifying our housing by saying, yes, you build duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, cottage floors, you name it. I want to upzone Raleigh I want to remove our height regulations so we can have something larger than three story apartment complexes. If we have more people here, we can, divert, we can increase our tax base, not our tax rate. I am very much against any new tax and fees coming up in this city. Save uh, for a lot of the other things in my platform. Nothing includes uh, new tax rates. And okay? everything pays for itself. Everything. This includes our first responders. I don't know if any of you know this, but 96% of our firefighters cannot afford to live in the city. So they don't. Uh, we also have a shortage of 100 police officers. They can't afford to live here either, so, or uh, even retain anybody because every municipality around us offers a better deal. And they certainly don't want to do it with this police. They don't want to work here with this police chief or with this council that could obviously give a rat's ass about them. This is a, a very anti-first responder council that is also anti-housing. Just like it's written said, uh, this council does not care. They do not want you here. I mean, new people coming in here. So, uh, in summary, I do want to take care of our infrastructure with this new housing and with fees on ADUs and short-term rentals like Airbnbs. Use those funds to pay for code enforcement, to pay off our debt. That is what I'm looking for. Uh, Mr. Elmo, over here, also touched on my platform. Every, uh, every last one of these terms is something I'm supporting. I'm supporting this uh, ADUs, short term rentals, uh, expanded housing, a better first responder pay, and support. That is my platform. Good. Thank you.
Yeah, oh, yeah, Scooters. I forgot to mention that. Was my other one. Uh, scooters, yes, that's, that was my one kick when I first started getting into uh, politics here was uh, micro mobility. That was a huge thing. Great, I can now get cars off the road. Uh, we to do that. I want to bring them back. I want to reduce fees from the largest in the nation down to something a lot more manageable. So we're at $300, wasn't it? Uh, $300 per scooter. Yeah, $300 per scooter. You can have 500 per company and 1500 max in the city. Oh, 1500 per year. My fault. Ah, okay, so yeah, I want to get rid of that cap. I would say if you can do business here, by all means, do business. If you fail, if you fail. If you succeed, by all means, then good for you. I want to give you that liberty to do so. Because if the more cars you get off the road, you know, the more walkability, walkable we can become, and that's less traffic, that's less road maintenance that we have to do. Same thing goes with bikes. I, we need sidewalks around here, uh, and also protected bike lanes. I gave up my car to ride uh, ride to work, and it seems that every few weeks I have to change out my tire just because I ran over glass or whatever else. Or maybe I was hit by a car, and it has happened several times before. It, it's not safe for pedestrians. It's not safe for bikes around here. We need that infrastructure. If we're going to get cars off the road, then that's our solution. Walkability, rideability for the city. Thank you. Another question. Side that picture, like I'll see you right after. Sir. Twenty minutes after, uh, yeah. Wow. So another round of applause for Jacob and Robin. Thank you. Just the longest we've ever done this. Feedback on this, but I appreciate everyone's patience. And that number for libertarian voting has better go up this time. I, I can look up who you are. You know that, right? You can help me too. But anyway, thank you. Thank you.